chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians has long been one of my favorite books. It uh, is a book that I read a great deal just uh, for devotional purposes, just to be blessed. And uh, I have preached through Philippians, and I've never felt like I've done it justice. I've always felt like I've left more behind than I was able to take with me. And so lately I've been reading again in this book. But there's a tremendous uh, passage. I want to begin reading in uh, chapter 4 in the 10th verse, and I'll read through verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 11, verse 11 is the uh, verse that has caught my attention in that particular passage. Paul says, not that I speak from want, and this is it, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. The word content means uh, self-sufficient, sufficient within yourself. Literally, it means needing no outside assistance. In other words, Paul says, I have learned how to get along with nothing. I need no outside assistance. I have everything I need right here. Now, there is a self-sufficiency that is not of God, and then there is a self-sufficiency that is of God. And Paul uses this word that means I am self-sufficient. And he goes on to explain why he is self-sufficient, because the Christ who lives within him is supplying him with everything he needs. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, he's saying, since for to me to live is Christ, of course you have to take the whole book together, and he states in 121, for to me to live is Christ. And since life for him is Christ, Paul has said, I have learned how to be self-sufficient, content in any circumstance. Whatever state I'm in, whatever be my circumstances, I need no outside assistance. I like that rendering. I need no outside assistance. I don't need anything else to fill up my life. You know, the world has a way of making us happy, and then God has a way of making us happy. And I want to share that with you. I, I uh, had a thought as I read this uh, the other day. This is a state, a condition, that uh, the whole world longs to know. <clears throat> to be able to say, whatever the circumstance, it's all right. I need no outside assistance. I have learned how to be content, to be self-sufficient, to be satisfied regardless of the circumstances. Can you think of anything greater in life? Can you imagine any gold more precious? Can you imagine any commodity, any secret? If you could bottle that and sell it, you'd make a million dollars overnight. For isn't this what everybody's looking for? Isn't this what the whole world is looking for? To come to a place in their life where they can say, whatever the circumstance, whatever it is, I am satisfied. I am content. It would seem to me that perhaps one of the great characteristics of this age is dissatisfaction. And we live in a universe of malcontents, of discontented people. And this is the reason you see all of the frustration and all of the going after strange gods and all of the strange religions and, and all of the going after the drugs and everything else. That's why, because people are looking for something that will make them content. 
And it just seems to me that Paul here is striking at the very nerve of human life. And uh, he has learned the secret. For instance, he says in verse 11, for I have learned, in verse 12, he says, I have learned the secret. And uh, he uses two different Greek words translated learn. Uh, the one in verse 11 just simply means I have learned. But verse 12, it means to be initiated into a mystery, to have a mystery unfolded. And so the uh, New American translates it like this, I have learned the secret. Paul says, uh, through a period of time, I have learned the secret. I have learned how to be content, to be self-sufficient, where I do not need any outside assistance. All I need is what I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I was reading that the other night, and I thought, man, that is tremendous. Boy, that is great. And then there were two phrases that caught my attention, and I underlined them, and I said, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Verse 11, notice he says, I have learned. In verse 12, he said, I have learned. And I, just, I realized that this discovery of contentment in Jesus Christ is something you have to learn. It's not something that comes to you overnight. It's not something that you get in a great cataclysmic experience. It's not something that comes to you when you walk down an aisle and get on the knees at an altar and the, you hear angel wings flapping and the hallelujah chorus singing in your ears and you walk out and you say, well, now I have it. And the thing that really captivated me and began to speak to me was this. Paul said, I have learned. I have learned. This is something you have to learn. That means two things. That means it takes time and it takes experiences. It takes time and experience. And uh, personally, I, I want the secret, but I don't know if I want to learn it. I don't want to take the time to learn it. And yet, this is what God has really been zeroing in in my own heart. This is something you have to learn. This is something that can only come with time and maturity as you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, all right, Lord, so we have to learn it. Now, how do we learn it? Uh, I'm ready to learn, so I'll take my Bible, my notebook, and go to a conference, and I'll learn it. And then what devastated me even more was how we learn it. Notice he says, I know how to get along with humble means. Uh-oh. And I also know how to live in prosperity. Now, that's good. I like that. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled, okay, and, uh, uh oh going hungry, both of having abundance, that's all right, and suffering need. Now, <clears throat> this is something you and I have to learn, and how do we learn it? How do we learn it? God has to carry us through and experience both of abundance, but also of having nothing. God has to take us through an experience of suffering need. Notice he said not simply having need, but suffering need. I've went for quite a while in, in, uh, in this life, in this Christian life, and in this new life in Christ, thinking that you might have need, but if you just had faith, and if you just enthroned Jesus as Lord, you might have need, but you wouldn't feel it. It wouldn't hurt. But Paul says, I have learned this through suffering need. And there have been times when I thought the very fact that I was suffering need, I mean that the need hurt me and that the need pained me, felt that I made me feel that I was out of fellowship with God. And uh, I've had people so even so much to say to me that if you're hurting and if you're feeling the pain and the agony and the frustration of need, then you're not walking with God. But Paul says... Uh, you see, it, it, if you don't suffer the needs, you might as well not be in need. You may as well be in abundance if you can't feel the need. What's the use of having pain if you don't feel the pain? You see what I'm saying? In other words, Paul is saying, I have learned how to be content. That's what I'm after. And this comes at the end of this letter, and I believe that this is the this is the mountaintop of the life of Christ. I believe that living the Christ-filled life, the end of it, the goal, the fullness of it is this, that I am able to stand among uh, the rubble of any 
devastating circumstance and say it doesn't matter. I don't need this. Take this away, I don't need it. I have learned the secret of being self-sufficient. I need no outside assistance. And I've learned this. How did I learn it? Well, I learned it. There were times when God gave me more than I needed. But then, if that's all I experienced, I would never have learned to be content. There were times when God took everything away from me, and I felt the pain of it, and I suffered need. I learned the secret. I've learned the secret. I said a moment ago that there's a way that the world makes itself happy, and there's a way the world, the way God makes us happy. And I want to share that with you. This is what Paul is talking about. The world seeks to make itself happy by increasing our possessions. We think the way to be content is by increasing our possessions. If I am dissatisfied this morning, if I am discontent, it's because I don't have what I think I ought to have. I don't have all that I want. There is some desire that has yet been unfulfilled, right? Can you, can you find a better definition of discontent as an unfulfilled desire? And so the way the natural man thinks is this. If I can increase my possessions, I'll be content. But you know how God makes us content? Not by increasing our possessions, but by decreasing our desires. You see? By decreasing our desires. This is the purpose of suffering need. This is the purpose of being in want. What he's doing is this, as the hymn writer said, that I may be weaned from all else beside and alone with Jesus to be satisfied. You see? How does God make me content? He makes me content by weaning me from everything else. Not by increasing my possessions, but by decreasing my desires. Until, and I, I really believe this, I think that what God is doing is he is working in my life until finally I have only one desire. Only one desire left, and that's for him. And friend, that's a desire that can be met. You know, it is the only desire that can be met. You know, the marvelous thing about Jesus is you can have all of him you want. Uh, somebody asked John D. Rockefeller one time how much money it took to make a man happy. He said, just a little more. Just a little more. How much does it take to make you happy? Just a little more. I had, uh, I'd always read this psalm and heard it preached that delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of thine heart. But, you know, uh, there are so many things I wanted. I'm sure you've been in that same situation. I'll never forget, a little while ago, somebody came by the church and left me a check. It was just an envelope, and the uh, secretary, there's an envelope for you. I didn't know what was in it, and I opened it up, and there was a check for $400. It's made out to me personally. Well, I knew that they must have meant that to go to the church, but then they just, you know, inadvertently made it out to me. And so I called up the lady and I said, now, what did you want me to do with this check? What, what, what's this check to be used for? She said, well, it's just to be used for anything you want. It's for you personally, just whatever you want to do for yourself. Well, I said, well, thank you very much. Just so happened I was alone by myself. My wife and family were out of town visiting her folks in Little Rock. And uh, so I, I went home and I said, here, I said, I've got $400. Nobody knows I have it. <laughs> I can do anything I want to with it. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I said, uh, and I said, I said, now what do I want? Here I've got $400 to spend on myself any way I want to, anything I want. And I sat home and I said, what is it now to say? What can I spend this on? And, you know, suddenly it dawned upon me there was not a thing I wanted. There was not a thing I wanted. And sitting there in my den, I realized that God had given me the desires of my heart. You say, well, don't you desire a bigger house? Well, if you want to give me one, I'll take it. But I, do, I can't say that's my heart's desire. Wouldn't you like a Rolls Royce automobile? Well, if you want to give me one, I'd be glad to drive it around and sell it. But uh, I can't say that that's the desire of my heart. You know, I, I couldn't really, there was not a thing that my heart desired. And there I sat, suddenly realizing, without knowing it, that God had made me content. 
There wasn't a thing I wanted. And I took that check and put it in the bank. It's long been spent now on food and other things, but, but uh, it was a marvelous, marvelous thing. Well, uh, how did Paul learn this secret? If you go back over in the first chapter, you'll find, you'll see some of the things that God took him through to teach him this. I want to mention just two. <clears throat> two things. First of all, God taught him through unfair circumstances. Look in verse 12. He says, Now I want you to know in chapter 1, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else. Now, Paul is in prison. Why is he in prison? For preaching the gospel. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is that fair? Is that fair for a fellow to be thrown in jail and to stand in the shadow of the acts simply for preaching the gospel? No, that's not fair. And the first thing that catches my attention is this, that God teaches us to be content through unfair circumstances. I believe that is one of the most difficult teachers and one of the most efficient teachers, unfair circumstances. Let me ask you this morning, and I'll ask myself, how do you react to unfair circumstances? Hmm? You say, I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. The Lord, here I've given you my life, and I've given up everything to serve you and trust you, and it looks as though, Lord, you might you might favor me just a little bit. Hmm? I thought that the fullness of the Holy Spirit was a vaccine that gave us a certain immunity against hardships and against unfair treatment. You mean to tell me that after these years of been preaching the gospel, I started preaching when I was 15 years old, do you mean that I haven't earned any points with God and gotten on his good side so that the Lord will... Uh, let me pass by some of these hardships and circumstances. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair for me to go through some tragedy when other people that don't love God as I do, uh, nothing ever seems to bother them. That's not fair, Lord. You know what God's doing? He's decreasing our desires. This is what David went through. David said, as for me, I... My feet were slipping, and I almost backslid because here I was serving God, and I was having problems. I looked at the man who was wicked and didn't even know God's name, and, and uh, he had no problems. He was rich. And he says, then I went to the sanctuary and understood. You see, we'll see this in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me just say that the first thing that Paul went through was unfair circumstances. Have you ever read First Peter? I preached a sermon on that once, uh, how to react when you're mistreated. I find that most Christians uh, get out of fellowship with God through mistreatment. Uh, kids at school, they'll come on and say, my teacher didn't treat me right. You know. Uh, how do you react to that if you're a Christian? How does a wife react to unfair treatment from her husband? How does a pastor react when he's mistreated by his congregation? See? Well, how did Jesus react when he was mistreated? You'll find that in 1 Peter chapter 2. And it's a beautiful passage. He says, uh, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it. Well, do you mean to tell me that a Christian can do right and suffer for it? Now, this is, I intimated the other day that I have a little bone to pick with some of the people today that are preaching that if you'll just serve God and trust Him, everything's going to be hunky-dory and you're just going to be happy. Well, now, I don't know. He says that uh, when you do what is right and suffer for it. Now, I'll tell you what is a conviction of mine. I'm getting ready to do a series of messages on First Peter. I believe that one of the, in the near future, 1 Peter is going to become the most relevant book in, of modern Christians. You know why? Because 1 Peter is the handbook on how to suffer right. How a Christian ought to suffer. 
But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure this fine favor with God, for you've been called for this purpose. Isn't that interesting? What is the purpose for which I've been called for? To suffer and to bear it in a Christ-like way. For you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return while suffering. This is what Paul did. You see this in Philippians 1. He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So, how did Jesus react? He simply did not react, but he simply rested his case with the one who judges righteously. So God teaches us to be content by unfair circumstances, and then also by unfaithful companions. You know, there's only one thing that can hurt us more than circumstances, and that's our friends. Notice what he says, verse 14, And that most of my brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Look at verse 16. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking that cause me distress in my imprisonment. I don't know of anything that could hurt me more than circumstances, more than my friends who do things to add to my affliction. Disappointment in people. You know what God's doing? He's decreasing your desires. He's weaning you from everything else. All right, now let's go back to our text, chapter 4. <clears throat> the capstone of this passage is verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, that is the secret that Paul learns. How did he learn that? The only way that Paul, the only way that you and I can ever learn that we can do all things through Christ is if God puts us in a situation where he's the only one we have to depend upon, you see. What Paul is saying in verses 10, 11, and 12 is this, that I have learned how to be self-sufficient. I have learned that my sufficiency is of the Lord. How did I learn that? Well, I learned it through suffering need. I learned it because God took everything else away from me and I had nothing left but the Lord Jesus. And in that experience, I discovered that he's all I need, that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, let's, let me just make two or three comments about that 13th verse. The all is emphatic in the Greek text. It comes first, you know, and, and that means that it's, has the place of emphasis and what Paul is emphasizing is that he can do all things not just a few things not just uh, most things but he said anything you name it you name it whatever it is all things I can do all things I like the way uh, Phillips translates this verse he says I am ready for anything through the strength of the one who lives within me a literal translation of that verse says, I have power for all things through him who puts a dynamo in me. The word strengthen is a participle, which means he's always doing this. He's always doing this. The word do means to be in full health. Uh, so Paul says, the Lord Jesus Christ is constantly, constantly pouring his power, pouring his strength within me. And this makes me healthy spiritually, and I can do anything that is necessary to do. I can do anything. Our word uh, dynamite comes from that word strengthen. Some years ago, uh, there was a fellow came along preaching a sermon called The Gospel is Dynamite, the dynamite of the gospel. Romans 1, 16, you know, uh, power of God. We get our word dynamite from that word power. It's the same word found here. And uh, for a long time, the, the power of the gospel and the power of the Christian life was uh, compared to dynamite. I got to thinking about that. I, I, I thought at first that was a great comparison. Then the more I thought about it, I thought it wasn't such a great comparison. You know what dynamite does? Well, uh, it makes a lot of noise, raises a lot of dust, 
and is over in just a second, and you can't find anything left. And really, I think that's a pretty good description of some of us as Christians. You know, we, we make a lot of noise, raise a lot of dust, and get a lot of attention, but it doesn't last very long. Isn't that right? Well, there's another word we get from that word. We get our word dynamo from it. You know the difference between dynamite and dynamo? Dynamite is happened just once, and that's it. But a dynamo is a continual source of power, a continual source of energy. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is this, I can do all things through Christ who puts a dynamo within me, you see. The Lord Jesus Christ has put a dynamo, a generator, within me. Therefore, he is continually, continually infusing me with power and continually infusing me with strength. Therefore, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I need no outside assistance. I've learned to need no outside assistance. Now, if you still feel this morning that you need some outside assistance, you still need some things to patch out your joy, well, you haven't learned the secret yet. You may know it intellectually, but it's one thing to know it intellectually, another thing to know it experientially. And I have an idea that what God is wanting to teach every one of us is this. I, he wants me to learn the secret of being content. I thought I was content. And uh, God has these ways of showing us that we're not. I'll never forget when this church in Merritt Island uh, called, uh, called me. I had a real struggle with that. And I remember going out in the back garden one night, and I just thought, I don't see how I can leave this church. I don't see how I can leave these people. Uh, they just mean so much to me. And the Lord said to me, he said, I thought you'd been preaching that all you need to make you happy is Jesus. And I said, well, Lord, I have been preaching. And he said, well, if all you need to make you happy is Jesus, he's going to be with you down there. And I said, yes. Well, then why is it such a pain for you to leave here? You see? If there's anything else today, if there's anything else that I can say, if I need that to make me content, and I've not learned the secret. This is why God said to Abraham, I want you to take Isaac and offer him up. It wasn't Isaac that God wanted to die. It was Abraham. This is the end of side one. Please turn your cassette over for the conclusion. Closed by, I heard a tape of Vance Havner, and I keep referring to him. He's, if you don't know Vance Havner, never heard his tapes, you ought to listen to him. He, he's a tremendous man. He's been a blessing to me. Yeah. I heard him speaking, and he made this statement. He says, <clears throat> the Bible says Christians have everything and have nothing. That's what the Bible says. He says, the devil comes to you, and he says, listen, if you'll serve me, I'll give you this, and I'll give you this, and I'll give you this. And you say to the devil, you can't give me anything because I have everything. The devil says, all right, since you won't follow me, I'm going to take this from you, I'm going to take this from you. He says, you can't, I don't have anything. See? <laughs> devil can't give you anything because you have everything. He can't take anything from you because you don't have anything. <laughs> don't you know that frustrates him? <laughs> That's exactly what Paul is saying. Devil says, Paul, I'm going to give you everything. He says, I don't need it. He said, I'm going to take everything from you. He says, that doesn't matter. I'm content. You see, you, you become invulnerable. Isn't that tremendous? It takes all the fear of living away. Fear of the future away. Fear of any circumstance. Are you afraid of some circumstance? Of something that might come your way or something that may not come your way? Something that may not work out? Paul says, I've learned that I need no outside assistance. I've learned to be self-sufficient. Because Jesus Christ, who lives within me, is my continual source of health and vigor and joy and satisfaction.